Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. I want to get us started because, as you all know from experience, these sessions tend to go over uh, time, so I want to get us started uh, right away if we can. Welcome to the session on inclusive education, an imperative for advancing human rights and sustainable development. I want to start by thanking UNESCO for hosting our event and for the missions of Colombia and Portugal uh, for their sponsorship and support of the session. Today's session is uh, going to be captioned. I'm going to give you a couple of um, introductions and housekeeping. Just let's start with accessibility. Um, the session, as you can see, is captioned and we have sign language interpretation. They're available in the room, but also via UN TV. Um, I want to introduce myself to start. <clears throat> My name is Connie Lauren Bowie. I am the Executive Director of Inclusion International. I'm very happy to be here today with uh, some uh, excellent speakers on a topic that is really important to Inclusion International. Uh, we will uh, introduce speakers in, as, as they are about to speak rather than going through the, um, the whole panel. But the format for today will be that we'll have introduction um, and then opening remarks, and then we'll have a short panel and closing remarks. So the panel will be in a more discussion format, and I hope that if we can keep to time, there'll be some chance for questions. That, I think, is what I needed to say in terms of accessibility and housekeeping. I'm looking for Fede in case I've forgotten anything, but I think, I think we can proceed with the, with the substance of the session. So again, welcome. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to um, ask uh, Estelle Zadra, who is the liaison officer for the UNESCO office here in New York, to start with opening remarks. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, and thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and to welcome you, distinguished panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, our protocol observed. Um, it is a great pleasure for UNESCO to welcome you at the discussion today on how to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education for all. The ambitious and transformative development agenda adopted in 2015 clearly stated that inclusive and equitable quality education should be ensured for all. More than ever, it is important to step up our effort to move forward towards attaining the Sustainable Development Four related to education. We all agree that this should be our shared responsibility and goal. But we are a long way from ensuring that all people have equal opportunities for educational progress and lifelong learning. And we know that children and youth with disabilities are amongst the most vulnerable to exclusion from education and marginalization within systems. Unfortunately, the most vulnerable and marginalized children and youth, including those with disabilities, have been hardest hit by COVID-19 pandemic. The prolonged and repeated class and school closures have resulted in learning losses and increased dropout rates, impacting the most vulnerable students and disproportionately. Clearly, there's an urgency to develop and implement education policies and programs that are more inclusive, as we will further discuss today. Ladies and gentlemen, as you might recall, the last September, the UN Secretary General convened the Transforming Education Summit at UN headquarters here in response to education crisis, a crisis of equity, quality, and relevance. 87% of national commitments to transform education expressed during the summit recognize the priority of addressing the needs of the most vulnerable learners and communities by ensuring more inclusive education systems. How can we accelerate this transformation to make the inclusion of learners with disability a reality? This is the question before us today. Every learner matters equally. This is what inclusion is about. It is not an easy task because inclusion calls for transformation, for a paradigm, paradigm shift in the philosophy and practice of education, away from one size fits all approach. Allow me now to put forward a few essential drivers of inclusion that UNESCO is pushing for. First, 
governments must ensure that adequate legislative frameworks are in place to enshrine the rights to education and fight all forms of discrimination. Every government should have a statement of principle on inclusion and equity that sets out a vision to guide reforms and debates, whether it be on language or on special needs or other dimensions. Second, countries require a precise understanding of who is excluded, why and when, at what stage of the educational journey. This calls for more disaggregated data from a variety of sources, and from investment in stronger national statistical systems. This brings me to the third point. How do we build education systems that make diversity a strength and where every learner matters equally? Teachers and school leaders must be at the heart of this process. They need to be empowered and supported through initial training and professional development in pedagogies that are sensitive to learning differences. It demands a change of culture in the classroom, encouraging more collaborative learning and valuing diversity. We all have a role to play in advancing our common agenda towards building inclusive education and inclusive society. UNESCO stands with you in making this a top political and policy priority. Ladies and gentlemen, UNESCO has been and will continue working to step up global actions on inclusion. Next year, we will celebrate at the 30th anniversary of the Salamanca Statement adopted in 1994. As you may know, the conference made a significant commitment towards the transformation of the education systems. We count on your engagement to ensure that those with special education needs must have access to regular schools, which should accommodate them within a child-centered pedagogy capable of meeting their needs. I thank you for your attention, and I wish you a very successful event. Thank you very much, Estelle, and thank you again for um, being here for UNESCO. We, are very, we always appreciate UNESCO partnerships on inclusive education, and we look forward to working with you uh, on the 30th anniversary. I can't believe it's been 30 years since Salamanca. Yes. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I now have the pleasure to introduce um, the Honorable Excellency Ms. Ana Sofia Antunes, the Secretary of State for Inclusion in Portugal. She's going to give us some opening remarks. Um, Ms. Uh, Antunes is the Secretary of State of Inclusion of Portugal. She held the position of Secretary of State for the Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities in Prime Minister Antonio Costa's first and second governments. We're really happy to have you here and thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, I really like to thank uh, to um, all of you and first of all to UNESCO and International Inclusion the kindly invitation to be here today and to have the opportunity to co-organize this event um, and to have the opportunity to talk to you to give you a, a perspective about our way uh, about uh, inclusive education in Portugal. Portugal has come a long, long way um, regarding inclusive education, regarding the transition of children and young people with disabilities to mainstream schools. Uh, this process dates uh, back to the 1980s when we um, promote the transition about the uh, vast majority of children with physical and uh, sensorial disabilities to the regular schools. And this process um, continued uh, or was concluded in 2008 uh, with the determination of the government to the transition also uh, the children with uh, intellectual or uh, development disabilities. Well, um, 10 years after of this uh, determination, uh, we could see that we have still uh, uh, a way to do. Because um, although we had 98% uh, of our children and young people with disabilities uh, in the regular schools, we have, uh, in fact, uh, integrating schools and not really inclusive schools. Uh, we saw in many situations 
that uh, uh, in spite of uh, we have um, uh, we, we were in the front line uh, uh, in comparison with some other uh, uh, education uh, systems, uh, we still could see uh, situations of non-inclusion in our schools. So we decided in 2018 to approve new legislation to uh, reinforce uh, the importance uh, and uh, the, the, the measures uh, of um, learning um, schools, learning uh, process um, to reinforce uh, these measures, especially considering and centering this intervention uh, in the uh, classrooms, uh, considering uh, always um, a multidisciplinary way of uh, doing, uh, putting work together, not only the teachers, but all the technicians and also the families of these uh, children with disabilities. But always uh, with an intervention centering in the classroom. Um, uh, with this proposal, uh, we try to uh, bring to the schools uh, a way of work uh, with all the uh, partners uh, that intervene in the educational process together, the families, the teachers, the special teachers, and also the technicians that work with these uh, young, uh, young, uh, young people, these, these children uh, with disabilities. Uh, one of the uh, points that, that uh, for us uh, was a priority uh, was the centrality of the curriculum and um, to emphasize its flexible uh, management uh, to um, guarantee that uh, and, and ensure that uh, when these ch children uh, finish their uh, compulsory uh, living uh, schools, uh, they uh, achieve uh, uh, the correct and needed competences uh, as the other children, uh, but, uh, uh, of course, considering that uh, they can do it uh, on another way or on another tra trajectory. Um, another point that for us is uh, crucial uh, is to uh, emphasize uh, that uh, this is not only a paradigm for us, this is a practice. Uh, we, we understand, we understood that uh, we don't need to categorize to, um, to intervene. We don't uh, start the process by identifying uh, the, um, the incapacities or the difficulties, but uh, uh, first of all, uh, the, the capacities and the competences of uh, each student. Uh, and uh, with these principles, uh, we uh, construct a way to face uh, differently the curriculum and try to weigh the correct, um, to try to find the correct way to uh, pass these contents to the to the to the child. Um, I'm absolutely convinced, um, and uh, this is of course the the way that we sh uh, choose in Portugal. That is, is the only way to guarantee. Uh, not only the presence of the children with disabilities in our mainstream schools, but all, all, also the only way uh, to guarantee uh, that they are uh, included not only in the um, uh, in, uh, educational processes, uh, but also in the school culture and also in uh, educational, uh, ed educational community. Uh, thank you, thank you for this opportunity, and I'm available to the questions that you intend to do. Thank you so much, and thank you for sharing your the experience in Portugal, which we often will point to uh, internationally as one of the experiences we all learn from. And um, uh, particularly, I think your remarks about the difference between moving from integration to real inclusion and what that looks like is very uh, a very good way to start this session. Um, and so, thank you.
very much for being here, and we hope to have some time at the end, and um, if the um, Secretary of State is still available, we'll um, direct some questions to, to from the audience. Um, so I'm going to, um, we have four panelists for a, what we're going to, hope is going to be a sort of informal panel discussion. I have two sets of questions. The first round of questions, I'm going to give each of the panelists um, a chance to introduce themselves and to talk about who they are and their perspective on inclusive education. And then a second round of questions will be much more about, you know, very short interventions from each of the panelists about their recommendations for moving forward on inclusive education. So the first panelist I, who I would like to introduce is Danny Dixon, who is sitting beside me. Uh, Danny and Stephanie Gottlieb, his mom, uh, are going to talk about their experience with inclusive education. Stephanie, unfortunately, was not able to be with us. She was planning to be here and couldn't travel, although I think she's arriving later this week, so you'll have yes, a chance to meet her. Just caught the flight. Uh, she, just, she just got on the flight, so we're anxious to see her. Uh, so Danny and Stephanie prepared this video uh, before they left home. We're going to play this video first, and then you'll hear from Danny uh, around the recommendations piece. So um, we can play the video, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie. And I'm Danny. Um, thank you for the opportunity. We're going to talk about um, Adam's journey of inclusive education and um, some of the challenges um, uh, he faced um, and we faced. Anyway, Adam, Adam has um, very high communication and behaviour support needs. Um, he also lives with um, autism and and uh, intellectual disability um, education journey. So he started off at a local preschool, um, a local inclusive preschool, um, and had the first two years there and was really happy, was a really valued member of the community. Um, uh, disability was just seen as an aspect of diversity, which they welcomed and... Adam was Adam, and he, yeah, he had a great time. Um, he then went on to, we then thought about school transition, and I suppose that's when the real um, challenges began because it was just, it was just imposed on us and it assumed um, that Adam would need to go to a segregated education setting. This was... This was said by the school transition coordinator, by everyone really in our lives, uh, except for a few who said maybe we want to think of different options. But we just kind of thought that's what you did when you had a high needs like Adam did. Um, and it certainly wasn't presented to us that inclusive education or him just going to the school with his brothers and sisters was an option. So we, Adam went off to... Uh, a segregated setting. Um, it was also presented as as a centre of expertise where he could be with his peers of similar abilities, whatever that means, um, and he would get expert expert help with learning um, that from people that absolutely understood him and could really progress him to his maximum potential. Spoil warning: they did not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Adam went off to school um, and became really unhappy in a nutshell. Is that it? It broke. Can we get it back? It's broken. <laughs> uh, I should, while we're waiting to get it back, I should, two things I apologize, Danny, I should have said is that uh, Danny is actually here speaking as a sibling uh, to his brother Adam, who Stephanie was referring to. Stephanie is Adam's mother, and also that they are in Australia, <laughs> from Australia. Um, so I should have said those things. If we can't get the video back. That's a shame because there's a good bit at the end. <laughs> Hi everyone. Okay. Hi everyone. I'm Stephanie. Fast forward. <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm Stephanie. And I'm Danny. Um, thank you for. 
Okay. Okay. We're we're going to move on. <clears throat> I apologize for technical difficulties. It's it's not a session at the UN if there aren't tough technical difficulties. Um, so we'll try to come back uh, and do the end of that video. Apologies, Danny. We'll it, we'll come back and try to finish that, and then we'll also come back back to Danny for comments uh, ab about the video and the recommendation. So hang tight. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you very much uh, to uh, Stephanie, who's not here, and Danny, and we'll try to hope, hopefully hear from them again in a minute. Um, I'm going to turn now to um, Ms. Daniela Gisera. Daniela, I apologize if I've mispronounced your last name. Um, Daniela is an expert in education and the assistant director of international partners, partners at Perkins School for the Blind. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Connie. Um, oh, would you ask? Yeah. Sorry, you ask the question? I, I was going to ask the question, which is, um, from the perspective of a teacher, what do you think are the steps that teachers and educators need to take to push inclusive education for all? Well, I think this is a very important question, because when we talk about inclusive education and we say all, we mean all children. Very often, children with disabilities especially those with the most severe and complex disabilities, are indeed forgotten. In low and middle income countries, we know that at least half of these children are completely out of school. If you can imagine, some never leave their homes, and this is extreme exclusion. Even for the children who are in schools, we just cannot sit back and assume that they are included in learning. In many places, we see school enrollment without attendance and attendance without learning. And this is because including children with disabilities in learning is more than building a ramp for access to the school building. It is about access to materials, teaching strategies, and playful learning environments. As a teacher, I can say that we want to help these children learn, and we feel sometimes the desperation of parents. I can think of the mother of, of Baldo, a lovely young boy with cerebral palsy in Mexico. The mom came to one of the schools, Perkins Supports, and she said to the principal that that school was the last chance her son had to learn, the last chance. So Connie, your question is, how can we teachers push for inclusive education? First, let me tell you that I think parents are powerful. We just here, heard, we just here heard part of this testimony of Stephanie, right? And I believe parents and teachers, we are stronger together. We need to work together so we can push for inclusive education and children can access learning anywhere they are. Second, I think it's important to aware that many teachers do not have experience or have never been trained to work with children with disabilities. In Brazil, we met a blind, ball, a blind boy with additional disabilities. He was enrolled in his public local school. And this sounds like inclusion, right? The issue is that the only thing he was doing during the whole school day is that he was being walked by the teachers around the school campus. He was walking in circles all day, not learning. The teachers had good intentions. They didn't know how to teach this boy, but they believed he should be in school. They just needed training, coaching, and mentoring. Today, this boy is learning with his peers in a regular classroom. So when inclusion happens, the child with disabilities and the teacher both, they have the support they need to unlock learning. And this is not all because inclusion is not only a better experience for children with disabilities, it is a better experience for every child in the classroom. It is about children learning together about diversity, equity, and belonging firsthand. And these are skills that we all need. So this is how I think we get to inclusion. 
So the question really is, how can we, the teachers, create classroom where every child belongs? Policies, guidelines, toolkits, and better data are absolutely needed. And it's so good that we have more of these than ever before. And to make a difference in classrooms with individual students, teachers, we need more practical support, more training, not one-off certificates. We need coaching and mentoring over time. And of course, technology has a role to play. But teachers, we do not always need super high-tech solutions. Remember this, learning starts with communication. A trained teacher knows that with simple tools, she can give a child the power of communication and the agency to make choices. And even you know, for children with multiple and complex disabilities, communicating can be difficult. But even making simple choices like yes or no can be transformative. A teacher can support a child to communicate, yes, I like this, I want more food, or no, I do not feel comfortable alone with uncle. So learning engages the whole child. And we, the teachers, are at the front lines of learning every day. Around the world, we have 240 million children with disabilities, and we know all of them belong in school. So to push to quality and inclusive education, let's give the teachers the hands-on support we need, we need to unlock the power of not only a few, but all children. Thanks so much, Daniela. It's really, um, it's really nice to hear um, from a teacher's perspective who's so passionate, and we're really glad that you're here with us, and we'll come back to you with some ideas about recommendations. From a completely different perspective, one of the issues that we've been talking about for a long time is the investment in inclusive education and investment in education generally. And so we're, the next speaker is going to talk from uh, the perspective of the World Bank. Um, the World Bank is a major player in uh, investing in education globally. Um, Ms. Ruchi Kulbir Singh is a friend and colleague for much time now. Um, really happy to have you here, Ruchi. Ruchi works as a disability inclusion specialist at the Social Sustainability and Inclusion Global Practice at the World Bank. Uh, she has over 12 years of experience leading and supporting teams across South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa in disability inclusive uh, development. So Ruchi, uh, the question that we'd uh, asked you to consider uh, was that we know the importance of enhancing stakeholder capacity and service delivery at the country level. Could you tell us how the World Bank supports such efforts towards building inclusive education systems? Thanks, Connie. And um, I would like to kind of open this discussion. I want to talk about the whole question around stakeholder capacity and service delivery, not only from an education lens, but also from a social inclusion systems perspective as well. Because as we all know, education and inclusive education goes beyond just the classrooms and schools and it goes into our communities and homes as well. So at the bank, we've been trying to you know, look at how do education, how can education systems advance inclusion in education and we've been trying this also via our analytical work as well as our implementation support work to our client countries. And we've been trying to understand what works at the country level and if that can be used to scale up and of course do capacity building as well around it. So when we look at evidence, particularly from Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, we see that there has been an increase in the number of studies and projects that are looking at mainstream inclusion since 2011. Mm -hmm. However, there is very little research and evidence that captures the effectiveness and the impact of the different approaches and how governments implement inclusive education in the classrooms. What has been even less researched that are the multi determinants of multi dimensional determinants of disability inclusive education the social factors 
and the non-school barriers which persist throughout the schooling years, which tend to play a significant role in school influencing school access and attainment. And these factors are socioeconomic status, perception of value of schooling for a child with disability, the notions of stigma, availability and access to existive devices that Daniela just mentioned, community transport, how children will get to school and back, and additional out-of-pocket expenditures and how that link and relate to government benefits and resources. All of these have an implication of how children get to school, when they get to school, and why do they drop out. While there has been a global focus on the need for inclusive education, the shift that we are encouragingly now seeing is a more recent acknowledgement that inclusive education's implementation and capacity building needs to be undertaken in a contextually relevant and appropriate manner. It is in this regard that a significant need exists to understand and document what works at an implementation level. Developing such knowledge base, we think, can help evidence-based planning and effective program and capacity delivery and development. At the World Bank, our work is supported by two trust funds, the Inclusive Education Initiative and the recently concluded Disability, in Incl Disability Inclusive Education in Africa program. And we focused on understanding and generating evidence of what works and the barriers and the enablers at the local level. Just to give a few examples of context of, of, of implementation, we recently did an evaluation of innovative continuous professional development program in Sierra Leone in partnership with Humanity and Inclusion to understand if post-training support to teachers leads to increased use of inclusive, inclusive teaching classroom practices. We used a community, um, um, community of practice model, video training modules, as well as a mentorship approach, and found that post-CPD support has a significant impact not only in the ways and the methods used by teachers to teach, but also teachers' own expectations and outcomes of goals for children with disabilities. Similarly, in another project, we asked teachers from Zambia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone about their continuous professional development opportunities and experiences that they have learned that, that and, and we learned that there, although there is a general desire for more training on inclusive education, there is no professional or financial incentive for these teachers to attend such trainings, which are often carried out by INGOs and NGOs in collaboration with the governments. In addition, special school teachers reported receiving more training than mainstream teachers and also mentioned receiving more scholarships and training opportunities and support in terms, in, in, in terms of um, uh, teaching and learning materials. While teachers and schools are key to bring, bringing change towards making everyday educational transactions equitable, investment in capacity development of low and low and middle income policy implementers is also crucial, is what we believe, to create an environment where teachers and schools are supported and encouraged. And of course, the application of such evidence in designing projects with strong feedback loops and reflection points is the way we can scale these implementation uh, of not only service delivery, but also capacity building. Such approach would always support a more robust way of pushing locally driven implementation and increasing the knowledge uh, base around inclusive education. And I would like to make one last point, if I may, before I close, is that we need to find a sustainable way of financing and incentivizing locally led innovative approaches in inclusive education, programming as well as implementation. We have tested this at the World Bank through our trust funds and this is a proof of concept that can often work. So sustainable funding 
from mainstream education financing can unlock possibilities and we need to find better ways and keep on pushing towards that advocacy. Thank you. I'll stop there. Um, and so our last initial speaker uh, is Diane Richler. Diane is a past president of Inclusion International and a former chair of the International Disability Alliance. She chairs Inclusion International's expert advisory group uh, of the Catalyst for Inclusive Education. She is also a friend of some years, and so I'm really happy to have you here, Diane. Thank you so much. And the question we've asked Diane to prepare for is, what are the initiatives that can support multi-partnership collaboration on inclusive education, and what are the actions that organizations and governments can take to ensure their investment advances inclusive education? Thank you, Connie, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, great to see uh, a number of old friends here in the room, and uh, looking forward to meeting more of you. Um, before I answer your question, Connie, um, everyone's had really good ideas. But I really feel as if I can't start talking about um, partnerships without acknowledging how far we still have to go. Um, you know, I, I feel, and I've, I feel this as I sit here at the United Nations, it's like the parable of Sisyphus, like we're pushing this rock up the hill, but globally we're not making terrific progress. And I'm afraid that if we don't mobilize our energies together, that rock is gonna start pushing us down further and further. And, um, you know, there are fabulous examples. And uh, um, I made a joke with the Secretary, Secretary of State for Portugal that sometimes I think that uh, Inclusion International should get a, um, get reimbursed by the Ministry of Tourism from Portugal for sending people to look there. We all do the same with New Brunswick, and we have some people here from New Brunswick, Canada. So that's one of our fundraising um, plans. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, I think that what's really interesting about both those examples, and I think you were very clear about this, Secretary, is that you started by including learners who had physical and sensory disabilities, and then you moved to include learners with intellectual disabilities. And then you said, no, inclusion is for everyone. And until systems make the decision that inclusion is about everyone, we're tinkering around the edges and, and we don't see a lot of change. And you know, our representative from UNESCO talked about the fact that so many of the commitments made by governments at the Transforming Education Summit mentioned inclusion, mentioned some mentioned disability specifically, but when you look at their national plans and what they're doing, they're not making the kind of fundamental systemic changes that are needed in terms of their education systems to make inclusion possible. So uh, I think that you know, the Secretary General's message was about the need to transform education and for inclusion to become a reality, we really need to think about transformation, not about incremental changes. And one of the things that came out of the, um, out of the summit that was really um, initiated because at the uh, pre-summit that was held a year ago in Paris, there was no mention of disability. Uh, a meeting of ministers, uh, ministers of education from around the world, no mention of disability in the program. Uh, very little participation by anyone with a disability in, in the whole meeting, certainly not in any of the uh, plenary sessions. And so a number of civil society groups got together and said, like, what can we do? How can we change this? And we launched a call to action um, asking people to join in to, um, to help to achieve inclusion and to transform education to include learners with disabilities but also to improve education for all. I'll just very quickly mention um, the key elements of the, um, of the call to action, which are to increase uh, budgetary allocations 
um, to include learners with disabilities to be at least 5% of education budgets, to set medium to long-term targets to ensure that all learners are reached in all education programs, and finally, to ensure that all education programs and grants mainstream disability and include disability inclusion criteria and targets. Now, this call to action was developed by a coalition of civil society that included the International Disability Alliance, which is organizations of persons with disabilities, the International Disability and Development uh, Consortium, uh, disability and development organizations, and the Global Campaign for Education, um, a civil society organization just working on the improvement of, of education. Since we launched that call, um, we've had almost 200 signatories. UNESCO has signed on to it, UNICEF has signed on, the World Bank has signed on. Um, I'm afraid that the Secretary of State may have to leave a little bit early, so I'm gonna include one of my recommendations right now. And uh, we would really like Portugal to sign on. You're already doing all of these things and it would be a great inspiration. We have other go governments that have signed on, but it would be a great um, show of leadership if we could count on your support. So I'll make a more concrete recommendation later, but that's all I'd like to say now. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Um, so we're going to try one more time on the end of the video, and then we'll let Danny uh, speak to the video, but also to uh, his remarks. I'm going to maybe give him a little bit of extra time if we can't get the video. So one to of go. the big go ahead, whoever's got the challenges <laughs> of 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 segregated education um, and the education system as well was the low expectations, which Jenny wanted to talk a little bit about. Was what Anne was in, expected to learn to do was to throw a ball at it. That was the whole learning expect, expectation. So Mum and I did some digging and we found one of the learning objectives for the first six months of the year. The objectives were, Anna will give the adult the open door picture while waiting at the door to go out. Objective two, Adam will follow familiar instructions within in the classroom, e.g. get your bag, go to the toilet. <coughs> Objective 3, Adam will follow a three-part vertical schedule during morning work sessions. 4, Adam will independently wash his hands after using the toilet. 5, and then we'll independently stir the pikelet mixture with a wooden spoon during cooking sessions. So yeah, these are just the most basic things that Mom said these were things that he would have learned already through preschool. And at home. So, like, the expectations were really low. I asked for a meeting with the school. Um, and said, look, I think Adam's really bored, he's unhappy, I don't think he's engaged in his learning, I think it's really not meeting his educational needs at all, I actually didn't think he was learning. A really pivotal moment for me was when, in that meeting, um, they explained to me that what they'd done, they'd done some assessments of Adam um, following you know, my, my raising concerns and that he couldn't actually do the most basic of, of tasks. Adam got the whole task and threw it in the bin. Oh, no, actually, sorry, he didn't throw it in the bin. He put it in the finished box first. Um, and they said to me, look, I clearly, that was a clear demonstration of how disabled he was and that, you know, would I really need to be realistic about my expectations. Uh, he then got the, the uh, whole activity and put and the finished box and put it in the bin and looked at me and said mum home that was a really clear message for me that enough was enough and we really needed to do something it's really clear to us that um adam needed to go to school with his siblings in an inclusive setting that the benefits we just had to give it a go because it wasn't working where he was so off he went and he came into my primary school about grade two. Yep. And from what I saw, he was 
much happier, happier. He was learning the same curriculum as everyone else. He was interacting with his friend, with his peers, and gaining so valuable social skills. He was overall much more happier than he was at the uh, at the what's at the other schools and. And he was learning. He learned how to read and he learned how to do numeracy. Um, and he'd never he'd never been given the opportunity before. And all of a sudden, wow, he's going. Different abilities, absolutely fine, but he was learning. Like I said, the same curriculum as everyone else. Yeah. Adam did have an inclusive education, but um, we need we needed to be really vigilant in our advocacy that it that it was inclusive at all times. Probably inclusive, not just tokenistic inclusive. Exactly. Well, I went to a separate high school in Adam at first, which, which also was an had me in an inclusive setting, although in one, this experience and my interactions with the staff were not the greatest. So, I had, I saw how Adam was going at his second, second, his high school, and I just went to mum and like, get me out of here, get me into Adam's school, please. So thank you. Great to speak with you. Sorry, I can't be there in person, but Danny's there, I believe. Thanks, guys, for fixing the technology. We appreciate it. I think it was worth waiting for. Um, just before we move on to one last rant question for each of the panelists, I'm going to ask Danny if you wanted to add anything to the video before I ask you the question about recommendations. I'm sorry, again, about the complication, but is there anything you wanted to say or comment on about the video? I don't think so. No? Okay. I, I just I wanted to give you a chance because it's... It's very disconcerting when you're on a panel and that stuff happens. So um, thank you for being patient with us. Um, okay, so the, what we're going to do now is ask each of the panelists to take a much shorter intervention. And the way I usually do this to remind people of how short we would like it is to think about if you were sending a tweet. And I know, Diane, that maybe tweeting is not your thing, but <laughs> for those of you who use Twitter, a short like keep your characters uh, uh, low um, so that we can sort of have this as a basis of conversation. And this question is really about what key recommendations can you share for accelerating efforts towards inclusive education? And we're gonna switch up the order and we're gonna start with the last speaker on the panel, sorry, before, before the video, now that we're all, uh, and Diane, I'm gonna ask you to answer that question first. My request is very simple. We have a QR code that will take you to the call to action, which is available in Spanish, Arabic, French, and English. Sign on to the call to action. We need your support. Uh, whether you're here from civil society, from government, from a foundation, from a multilateral institution, we need your support. So sign on. Thank you. Very good tweet. <laughs> um, Ruchi, I'm going to ask you to go next. Yeah, absolutely. I think for, I would, my recommendation is that we need stronger partnerships between the education and the disability sectors. Disability inclusion continues to be seen as something that only disability focused organizations are responsible for, for doing and advocating. I think we need, we need to work to bridge that gap on bringing those two sectors together so that our advocacy and efforts can be stronger and more aligned. Excellent, thank you. Um, and now Danny, I'm gonna ask you to make your recommendations and I'm gonna allow Danny a little bit more time since we cut off his video. <laughs> Hi, so I've actually got two recommendations. The first one was that all families of children with disability must be given information about rights, evidence, and the lived experience of inclusive education. Families need to be able to access support so they can advocate to ensure that this right is afforded to their children. And, <coughs> sorry. And the second recommendation I would like to make is to put an end to segregated education, make it more 
education more inclusive, put pe people with disability into mainstream schools, make, make the effort to integrate them into the curriculum, give them the same opportunities to learn the same curriculum from everyone el that everyone else is learning. Don't just put them in separate buildings and say that's inclusive education. Don't just take them outside and walking around for hours. Give them the same opportunities to learn that everyone else deserves to learn. They deserve the right to an education and it is beyond important that we push for this. Thanks so much, Danny. Um, Daniela, you are last up on the recommendations. Thank you. I'm very moved by Danny, by your words. So thank you so much. My recommendations are a bit longer than a tweet, but I'm promised to be so short and quick. Um, I think that we as humans sometimes have a hard time imagining what we have never seen. And most people have never seen what it looks like when children with disabilities are truly included in learning, in making choices, at schools, and in their communities. Um, so I think that to push for inclusion, I think we need to focus on models that are working. And Ruchi, from the World Bank, you have mentioned something similar, right? There are schools where children are included. There are schools where, um, where teachers have um, mentoring and coaching, and there are schools where parents are engaged. And here we have the Secretary of State from Portugal, and there are governments who are investing in improved curriculum and structure supports at local and national levels. So we need to focus more on what is working. We need to, to focus on models that we can scale up over time. And we need to learn from this. We also need to do more uh, sharing across sectors so we can learn from our successes and our failures. Because yet, there is no country that has totally yet cracked the code on inclusion. We are all learning. So really, my recommendation is that let's show what is possible and let's continue learning together, just like we are doing here in this room. Let's focus on showing the world what children with disabilities can do, and let's believe together that every child can learn. Uh, thank you very much to the panel. Um, I, I don't know how many of you were here yesterday for the Civil Society Forum. Um, but Gopal from UNICEF, uh, who you know was here in the early days during the negotiations, I, I made a comment in his remarks about inclusive education from a UNICEF perspective, and I thought it captured really well the feeling of there's many good examples that uh, we hear from countries. We have experiences from teachers and from advocates. Um, what the way he conceptualized it yesterday was. We have the examples, we have the knowledge, we know what it looks like in many places. What we haven't figured out is how to take it to scale. And I think it, his comment really resonated with me because I, you know, we've been in rooms like this for 15, 20 years, uh, like just in terms of the convention and well, be, well before that with Salam the Declaration of Salamanca. It's, it's been a long time uh, that we've been talking about inclusive education. The shift that I hear is there's many more people in the room talking about real inclusion. They're not just talking about integration or access to education. Um, the examples we're hearing are much more thoughtful and we have a lot more experience at the trick and the challenge is how do we take it to scale. Um, so before I, uh, so we do have a, a, one more speaker and I wanna make sure to leave enough time uh, for our, um, to, and to inter introduce the representative from Colombia's permanent um, mission here in the UN. But I think I've saved us a little bit of time before I do that and I wanna take just one or two questions. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll take the questions all together and then, I'll, and then we'll direct them or you tell me if you wanna direct them. So I'll take, let's take three questions, Richard. Uh, Richard Reza, um, long-time campaigner for inclusive education, currently running the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum, but my heart is in inclusion as a teacher. 
And it's 20 years ago that we actually collected together on the World of Inclusion website, if you want to go there and look at it, examples of inclusion working. It, it, there's no shortage of examples of inclusion working. I did a project for the British government in 2003 where we filmed in 40 schools where inclusion was working. That's up on our website. So it's all there to be grabbed. It's not about that, in my view. It's about the political will to do it. And the point about, that I made in the forum yesterday we aren't going to get there until there is a transformative change in the paradigm of education. You cannot turn the current segregated education system into an inclusive one without changing the whole nature of the curriculum and what it is we're trying to do. So just three little points. One, we should have a curriculum where schools are judged on the progress each child makes from where they were before. And that should be what schools are rewarded for, nothing else. Not getting normative things. That means getting rid of PISA and all of that stuff, which is against disabled kids, basically. 8% are excluded, and that's what schools are working on. There have been endless working groups here at the UN and elsewhere to develop normative curricula to bring areas like Africa and South Asia upwards without including disabled kids. All of that is going against inclusion. The other thing we have to do is make it mandatory for all who enter teaching to do an inclusive education course. It has to be mandatory for all. They cannot become teachers unless they have this course. And thirdly, we need to upgrade and value teachers much more. In many of the places I visited across Africa and Asia, the teachers are at such a low status and with so little remuneration when they actually do a training on inclusion, it's not worth it. So they have to be valued and valued as inclusive practitioners and then it will start happening. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. I think those are answers, not questions. <laughs> um, I don't know your name. The gentleman in the back had his hand up first. We'll take him, and then I see someone up here in the front. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Apologies for me for standing, but you know I'm an autistic adult myself, and we talk about inclusion accessibility, so I need to be able to stand. That's the way I stem. So please accommodate my anxiety levels as well. But thank you, I just want to start off by thanking the Autism South Advocate as well, you know, for presenting your case study and especially um, your story. I think it's very inspirational. Um, and we talk about nothing about us without us and we live in, in a time where the neurodiverse voice, whether that individual is hypersensitive, hypersensitive, uh, semi-verbal, verbal, you know, they are, they are the experts and their voices need to be heard. And when we think about inclusive education, um, uh, excuse me, my name is Dr. Emil Gauss and I represent underrepresented groups on the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum with a mentor like um, Richard. And um, yeah, uh, I was also non-verbal for the first 15 years of my life, so apologies if you hear a delay in my speech. Uh, well, <laughs> my contribution, apologies. But um, we, I've got also an, a foundation and Edu360 that they provide inclusive education for neurodiverse individuals, and I'm a specialist teacher as well, so I can relate to the teacher that's, that spoke there. Now, we need to be specific when we talk about inclusive education because from the, the story is totally different from, this, uh, from the global south and the global north. As a South African, my first question would be, uh, what recruitment policies is there with reference to employing and training neurodiverse individuals, persons with disabilities, to be educators in the field of education? Because, and what role will they be? What is the role of the private sector? Just to give you an insight, as someone from South Africa, 2% of students that are neurodiverse finish school. And that doesn't mean that they will go to university. And remember one thing, when we talk about inclusive education, that child becomes an adult. And when you think about, from a global south perspective, 35% 35, um, 35 of these individuals have, have mental health challenges as well, with reference to isolationism and discrimination that these individuals experience. And just to give you a st statistic, 
in the global south, especially from South Africa, the living age of an individual that, that's on the autism spectrum is 35 years old. And if you look at the holistic cycle, it goes back to education as well. And the best, and from a personal experience, the best teachers are those individuals that are neurodiverse themselves and persons with disabilities. Because they know how to accommodate that child that is non-communicative. They know what measures must be taken to in order to include that individual, that child, and what support system needs to be in place in order to support the families as well. We're talking about the ecosystem. An ecosystem that consists of specialist teachers, uh, therapists, psychologists, and also uh, the community of practice which is, involves all of you. So I, I just want to ask regarding the recruitment policies in terms of um, recruiting neurodiverse individuals, especially persons with disabilities as well in the education sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's an excellent question and I will direct it. Just before I allow, I'm going to ask, just to uh, prepare her, I'm going to ask the Secretary uh, of State to answer the question about um, recruiting people, if you have experience, recruiting people with disabilities as teachers, but I'm, I'm not going to let you answer it just yet. I'm going to take one more question. Uh, so I, I'm not sure, again, I don't know your name, but welcome and, yep, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good morning, or afternoon, actually. I don't know what the time is. Um, everybody, my name is Santiago Velasquez. Uh, I'm actually originally from Colombia, but um, I live in Australia. I'm vision impaired, for those of you who cannot see. And I'm an electrical engineer. The uh, reason why I mention that is I'm the first electrical engineer student with a vision impairment in the global south. And that's not something that should be the case. I bring that up because education isn't sexy. Uh, and that's a big problem, right? When it comes to spending money and whenever there is a question of we should fund education, they say, no, nah, no, nah, we don't have the money. But when it comes to programs like we need to buy 10 new subs, each one costing $20 billion, somehow we do have the money for that. And my question to everybody, uh, and I have seen this as a Colombian living in Colombia and studying in Colombia. I have seen this in Australia. I have seen this in Sweden, in Spain, in the USA working. How do we go from education being a we have to do it because we should do it to education is sexy. If I study, I can contribute to society. How do we go from, yeah, I don't have an extra $10 to buy more pencils to, but I do have $20 billion to buy new apps. How do we go from, let's fund it. We can do it. We do have the funds. And the countries that do not have the funds, we can work with them to support them. How do we do that? Thank you. Uh, excellent question. Okay, I'm uh, going to try to condense the question so that we have time for the closing speaker. Um, I, I hear two questions. One of them, a, a couple of questions merged into one. The first one is about recruiting people with disabilities as teachers and recruitment strategies. I'm gonna ask the Secretary General from Portugal to answer that question if you have any experience in that area. Well, um, trying to answer uh, as quick as possible. Um, we um, are always trying to uh, promote um, permanent uh, training um, to the uh, teachers, not only to the mainstream teachers, but also the special education teachers. And it is fundamental to um, get to this um, technical staff all the support and all the uh, innovative information, uh, the update that is necessary to uh, work with uh, uh, so different situations. But let me tell something more about that. I, I don't want that you uh, leave this session thinking that Portugal is the paradise of inclusive education. <laughs> we, we have problems. <laughs> we have difficulties. Uh, I think the, the situation is that we try to face them with courage. We, we have the advantage that we, we start this, press, uh, this, this process um, uh, in decades ago, 
We have uh, more than four decades uh, working uh, in this perspective of inclusive education. But don't forget, in 2008, when we have to finish this process of this process of transition, we have to do it compulsory. We have to approve a legislation that de de uh, with the determination from the government that all the other children that still uh, were in special schools, segregated schools, will do this transition. And at that moment, it was a scandal in Portugal. Um, it happened, but uh, two, three years uh, later, the process was more um, clear and more uh, pacified. But in fact, when I start my functions in, go in the, the Portuguese government in 2015, when I went to the, the schools, the, the mainstream schools, in some of them, what I see, what I saw, uh, is that uh, especially the, the, the children with intellectual and autistic, autistic people um, were not uh, in the classrooms, in the regular classrooms, but they were still in separated places. And it's not inclusion. More or less, it's integration, but uh, it, it was not our objective to be in these separated rooms. They could be in segregated, segregated schools. It was the same thing. Uh, so what we try to do in these um, uh, last years, six, seven last years, uh, with new legislation and with new um, um, training uh, um, measures, uh, uh, programs uh, to the, the teachers, is to put these uh, children in regular classrooms with their colleagues, learning together, doing things together, playing together, giving them the opportunity to learn with flexible curriculum on their way um, as much as possible. Uh, and of course, we don't have all the children in uh, the children with disability in most uh, fantastic situation, but we have most of them. And I, I, I have um, some notion in this moment, this uh, passing these years, that one of the most important things to do this is the, to, 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 to change the, the mindset of the director of the school and also for the uh, equip that uh, coordinates the inclusive education in the school. Because if we gain these persons, we have a total diff different reality in that school. Uh, I think this is one of the most important things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, just before we have our closing remarks, I, um, I was I was thinking about the question about how to make education sexy and where to and where to direct that. I'm I'm gonna I don't know that any UNESCO officials ever been asked the question about how to make something sexy, but let's uh, direct the question. I think it's a, I, I think it's an actually important question: is how do we prioritize uh, investment in education generally as an important thing for societies? And so I'm going to ask um, our liaison representative from UNESCO to try to address that question. Thank you. Uh, and you will be surprised. It's yeah. not the first time, actually. Yeah, yeah. Really? Indeed, yeah. <laughs> no, it's very complex. I mean, I've been in the education um, sector for a lot of years, 20 years. Uh, and it has always been the, the, the same things. How do you go to a, a minister saying that you need to invest in, in education. How could we make the plea for that? Um, so we have tried several things, and that's true, it's, it's not sexy, but, but it's, it's fundamental for all societies. And what we need to do, definitely, is to showcase how uh, the cost of a failed education system on every aspect of our society, economic, political, that's very important, and I say political because, of course, uh, exclusion means people who can have 
not have a role in the society, and if you create frustration, if you create exclusion, you create uh, you, you don't create a citizenship to, to, to make a society, and you you can you can go to, to more complex issues than than just exclusion. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you because I'm worried about losing. Okay, time. so very quickly. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that what we've done, for instance, it's just an example. Uh, at the spring meeting uh, at the World Bank this year, it was the first time we had a meeting in the same room where we gathered together ministers of education and ministers on finance. This was the first time, and it was really very a great step because where we were able to have ministers of education be able to explain to ministers of finance why they need the money and why they need a budget. And it's, it's really my personal conviction that uh, what we have, you are doing, what your, your experience is, is the chance of all of our education system to transform education. Because we learn from your experience how to tackle diversity, how to embrace all the diversities, the diversity we need for the, the modern society and the years to come. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I, I was really trying to uh, have some time for speakers, and so I do apologize um, for uh, getting close to the end, but get, bear with us. We have the most important uh, uh, intervention from our uh, distinguished colleague, Ms. Arlene Tickner, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission of Columbia to the UN. I hope that because of the conversation, you may be able to reflect on some of the discussion as well in your comments, and thank you so much again for co-hosting the event with us, and we're happy to have you here. Thank you so much, Connie. This is by far the least important intervention. Um, I just want to, I, I want to thank um, all of the organizers on behalf of the Columbian Mission for allowing us to be part of this fundamental conversation. Um, I think the, the, the diversity of the interventions that we've heard um, speak to the importance of multi-stakeholder spaces such as this one. And I just want to say that as an educator myself, um, I have found the conversation um, both fascinating and disconcerting in many ways. Um, I just want to point out um, that the government that I now represent um, in my foray in the diplomatic world is, is firmly committed to these issues. Um, I just want to recall that um, in September of 2019, we hosted the International Forum on Inclusion and Equity in Education in Cali, and the Cali commitment outlined actions to redouble efforts to consolidate progress made since the Salamanca Conference. Um, I'm honored to represent the government of Gustavo Petro, um, who has I would say reiterated um, our government's commitment to both education um, and to inclusive education, um, both for peoples with disabilities, but also for um, persons in situations of vulnerability writ large. Um, having said this, I just want to pick up on several things that I thought were important in the conversation, um, which is what I was asked to do, more than promote my own country's position on these issues. First. Um, just, just listening to all of you, I, I wanted to make the point that children with disabilities um, are one component of um, many different types of diversity. Um, and I take very seriously the call that inclusive education means all children, um, it, most significantly children in situations of vulnerability, starting with children with disabilities. Second, um, I found fascinating um, and also worrisome the, 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 the conversation about integration versus, versus inclusion. Um, as Danny's and Stephanie's narrative um, pointed out quite clearly, many times integration can become a segregating um, force, um, which is not conducive to inclusion and which is actually potentially um, harmful um, to full inclusion of, of children with disabilities. Um, third, um, the whole question of, of parents being powerful, but teachers as well. Um, I think coming from a, a middle-income country, the need to um, join forces and the need to accompany teachers with appropriate training and support to be able to teach children with disabilities and engage with them on an equal playing field, if you like, um, is something that's fundamental. And I take very... Um, I take back with me the, the idea that good intentions are, are not equivalent to um, effective inclusion. And fourth and finally, um, Diane, and I think many of you pointed out the long road that continues to face us in order to achieve 
um, meaningful and genuine inclusion, genuine inclusion in, 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 in education. And I just wanted to point out several ideas that came up. Um, the whole notion that transformative ideas and solutions are needed, I, I find fundamental. But I also t t pick up the notion that a new educational paradigm is, is sorely needed, both for children with disabilities, but in general for education writ large. Um, education at all levels is, is undergoing severe crisis, and it most definitely needs to be rethought um, in, in very um, audacious and, and revolutionary terms, I would say. And, and just picking up on Santiago's point that how to make education sexy um, is something that I, that I think is quite important. And, and just finally, um, this is a matter of political will. I think it's also a matter of appropriate funding. Um, and so uh, Santiago has pointed out that why is it that we spend so much money on, 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 on defense and security policy and not on education? I, I take that point um, quite directly, but also in, in many countries in the global south, there are also beyond the political will needed um, severe fiscal constraints um, on being able to support um, education um, in the ways that it should be supported. And many of you have talked about teachers also in situations of vulnerability, and this is most certainly the case in the country that I represent. So I think a combination of political will, international, regional, national efforts and collaborations, but also economic commitments are fundamental. So thank you very much, and I found this a tremendously stimulating conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you again to the sponsors of the event. Thank you all for staying with us right to the end and through our technical difficulties. We're really happy to have you here and have a good rest of the Conference of States Parties.